The sun has left and forgotten me. It's dark, I cannot see. Your stories don't define you, but how you tell them will. I'm your host, Sarah Elkin. I call myself the chief story maker at Elkins Consulting, because it's really hard to have stories to share if you're not stepping out of your comfort zone and making them in the first place. And just a quick reminder for listeners who are interviewing for jobs, our new course, Get Hired Job Interview Storytelling, is available for just $199, and that includes the online course and a small group storytelling practice session. So visit elkinsconsulting.com for more information. Now, if you've been listening to this podcast, you know that I really love to hear good stories that demonstrate the way that people see themselves and the way they want to be seen by the world around them. And today's guest, Jeanette Jurgens, does that in a unique and wonderful way as an artist and a Montana rancher. I met Jeanette at the Montana Farmers Union Women's Conference in Anaconda and actually Fairmont Hot Springs in Montana, and I knew I had to get her on this podcast as soon as I started hearing her stories. Jeanette, thank you so much for joining me today on this podcast. You're welcome. Glad to be here. And um, I can't remember where exactly you're located in Montana. Can you share that? I live in Shelby, Montana. We're 30 miles south of the Canadian border. Yes, I know Shelby because... um, I went up there to pick up a friend who took the train from, I want to say Chicago, and ended up in Shelby, and I had to drive up to get her. And it is a beautiful drive from Helena, especially that first part when you go along the canyon and the Missouri River between Helena and Great Falls. And then it gets very stark and quiet. And um, there's something about that windshield time that just puts you in a different place. Do you agree? Yes, very much so. (laughs) Yes, it's inspiring. Sometimes I just have to get in the car and drive in order to clear my head. So, and there's lots of that to do here in Montana. (laughs) You could go for hours and hours and not see people. So, Um, Jeanette, I always start these recordings by asking the person, my guest, to share something about themselves that most people might not know about them. And this is so that our listeners get a different perspective of you before we dive into your stories. So what do you think? Do you have something you can share with us? Well, I am a furrier, which there are not many furriers in the state of Montana. And so um, I've been an artist. I've come from an artist family. And I got involved in the fur business through a friend who asked me to sew for him. So um, it's a quiet lifestyle, but I enjoy it. (laughs) So for our listeners, a furrier is someone who makes things out of animal fur, animal skin. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And um, I knew this about you because of your story at the Montana Farmers Union Conference. And one of the things that um, I guess I wanted to ask about, but I didn't have a chance at that conference, is where do you get your furs? Where do you get your animal skins? Most of my furs it come from, there's trapping all over Montana. The fever, otters, wolves, coyotes, bobcats, lynx, those all come from Montana trappers. The fox pelts that are for high fashion design, those come from Saga furs. And those are bought at fur auctions. And then I buy them from the trappers who buy from the fur auctions. Oh, interesting. And is there one in particular that you especially love working with? That would be a crystal fox. It's, it's, it's black and white with a brown undertone, and it is absolutely gorgeous. Mm, that sounds lovely. I know that you have some controversy over this, especially the trapping part. What um, what makes you comfortable and confident about working with these animals? Because I know that you love animals and um, that you honor them in the work that you do. And that when you create something out of them, it's really an honor and you understand that. So talk to me. So when I think about the trappers, 
And a lot of people think that it is very cruel. But what I'm usually working with are predators. And the predators not only affect the ranchers, they um, like the wolves and the mountain lions. And so when I can make something out of their beautiful pelts and come out of it knowing that that we've created something beautiful out of a predator that that is a good feeling Mm, i can understand that and there aren't a lot right i mean as far as how many pelts would you work with in a year well i probably um i would probably go through 100 150 coyotes quite a few beaver who, you know, and the beavers are a problem because they tie up the water rays. Um, most of my gauntlets, um, they're all from beaver pelts. Um, the wolves, I probably go through five wolves a year. And a lot of the buffalo hides that I get, they are, they come off buffalo ranches and that meat is used. You know, people buy the buffalo to butcher it and then I buy the hide and have it tan. Oh, that makes sense. That makes sense. So what got you into this? What was I know you said you had a friend that wanted you to sew something. Tell me a little bit about that person and what it was that he wanted. Eric is a trapper from Muscle Shell, Montana. And he had contacted me about eight years ago to sew leather purses and items for powwows. And he has, he does quite a few shows uh, around Washington, um, down in Tucson. They've been there for a month. And he called me up and asked me if I would be willing to sew. And I said, yes. And then about two years ago, he bought a fur company out of Idaho. And he said, if anybody can sew these, it would be you. So I went to Idaho, not knowing anything about furs or the treatment of pelts, and how to sew them. And I was taught by two wonderful ladies there that had a, quite a business. And they sold a lot in Big Sky and Gardner, around Bozeman. So it was, um, it was very enlightening, and I learned so much, and I just dove into it Mm -hmm. and it has been a wonderful adventure so far well you are definitely one of those people that once you get into something you want to learn everything there is to learn about it absolutely (laughs) i love to hear that i love that sense of curiosity that you just embody and speaking of curiosity when we first started talking you were telling a story about um, how you used to bring people in like ecotourists almost, I guess that's not the right word for it, but you'd bring people in to do your cattle drives. And that was like 20 years ago or something. And you, and of course my immediate thought was the movie City Slickers, which you mentioned during that story where you actually take these people that some of them have never been on horse before and you take them, you used to, I don't think you do this anymore. Is that correct? No, we do not do that anymore. But you would you would take these people on a week long cattle drive across the field across the ranches and transport those cattle from one ranch to another, one property to another, and that totally got me excited just to hear that story because I know that there's so many people that don't know where their meat comes from, they don't know where their food comes from, and um, I would love to hear I, I would love for our listeners to hear the story that you told about. Um, being in Las Vegas for a, a, some sort of a conference. Can you share about that story about when you met those people that you ended up inviting to visit you? My husband and I had went to the national final and we are not gamblers. So we were walking down Fremont Street, just looking around. And of course, we both have our cowboy hats on and our normal attire what we normally wear. And these folks walked up to us and she said, said, are you real cowboy and cowgirl? And my husband said, well, I think we're real. It's just our lifestyle, the way we live. 
And before we knew it, they had our cowboy hats on. We were taking pictures, having drinks together. We just really became very good friends. And then they said they wanted to come to Montana to experience our lifestyle. And it was very interesting. (laughs) Yes. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) We had a great time with them. Yes. And have you gone to visit them since then? No. My husband said he has no desire to go to New Jersey. (laughs) 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 But we are hoping that we get there. And then COVID hit, and so we postponed it a couple years. But we're hoping in the next couple of years to get to go. At least I do. Oh, cool. Well, and you did mention, and we'll we'll get into the story of their visit to Montana and what an adventure that was. And you did mention that she hadn't been on a horse before, and that it definitely wasn't her thing. So that's the image I have in my head. But when you told that story, um, even now I still chuckle about it because of this whole idea of them being coming up to you and introducing themselves basically with that question are you real cowboy are you real cowgirl and to me that just speaks volumes about how um how oblivious we are oftentimes to the lifestyles and the people and the cultures within our own country i mean these are people in new jersey in the united states and they are in las vegas which is just like any other big city, dirty, loud, um, noisy. And and then they start talking to these people from Montana and experience this completely different interaction because the cultures are so different. And what strikes me and has been through throughout my conversations with you and the other women in agriculture that I met at a conference is when we think about going somewhere else as americans we talk about going to france and people say oh the people in france are so rude or you know the 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 french are so rude and i think about how limited the exposure has been in order to generalize a whole community of people based on such limited interaction so for instance um when i was in paris I had a wonderful experience and people were very kind and polite and and yes there were loud people trying to get me to buy stuff in the most touristy areas of paris but you find that in new york city right you find that even in parts of montana not quite the same way but um i heard somebody say how rude people were in paris i said that was not my experience and then i went to southern france and southern France, Provence, and the the Pyrenees, the villages along the Pyrenees Mountains, are as different from Paris as Montana, parts of Montana, because even across the state of Montana, we have different cultures, um, as different as Montana and New Jersey. So all I could think was, if only people would explore across our country and see the differences and recognize the differences, then maybe our global community could be more understanding of those differences and not generalize so much. So that would be wonderful. Yes, it would be wonderful. So what was something that um, surprised them, especially about your lifestyle that evening when you're having drinks and laughing and taking pictures? And then the opposite, what were you surprised by about New Jersey? Because all, all we see about New Jersey here in Montana is TV, right? We see the the Desperate Housewives and, you know, the, the, what, I don't even remember what that show was called about the, the women, the wives in New Jersey. So what were those two experiences? When I got to talking to Donna, we found that our lives are completely different. When they learned that we heat our whole wood, so wood burns, that she had no idea. When she found that we haul our own water, from town, she was completely blown away by that. Um, that we have no stoplight. That we have one grocery store. Uh, her and her husband eat out like four nights a week when we don't. You know, everything we do, we 
raise our beef, we butcher our beef, we have beef in the freezer. They don't have anything like that. And then when I got to asking her about her world, she is the secretary for the mayor of this huge city. She dresses in fine clothes with high heels every day. She puts product in her hair and wears makeup. And we dress in work clothes. And I, and I often text her and say, you know, how is your high lifestyle today? You know, and I tease her because I don't, I don't get that. And I, I don't know what that's like to go to a beautiful office and wear fine clothes and go out to eat every night and, and go on vacations that are, you know, five star hotel. So it, it's really, it was really eye opening to both of us. And I think we've learned a lot since we've met, and it's wonderful. That you can like each other and find your heart-centeredness is in common, even if your lifestyles are completely polar opposites. Oh, yes. Yep. Uh, I love that so much, that you can develop this friendship. And it's not about envy either, because your lives are so different that there's no comparison. You can't compare the two. No, not at all. No, completely goodness. different. Yeah. Oh, goodness, who needs comparison, right? If you yeah. are in the place where you are supposed to be and you're fulfilled and you get to explore other cultures and experiences without having to change yours, but just to explore and be exposed to those things, there's no reason for comparison. No, and when they first came out to visit, you know, I, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, you know, we have muck boots and everything in my entryway and, and, you know, maybe our home wouldn't be as fancy as theirs or, you know, the way we live, we live on a gravel road, you know, and so I, I wouldn't change it for the world. But you know, nervous? Well, I was, yeah, because she... She stay only stays in five star hotels. You know, I've never been in one. I have some so, to have them come out here and experience our lifestyle. I felt kind of like uh, I, I'm back in time, right? Compared yes. to her lifestyle, we're not fast paced. I I would say it's a different time, not backward but <laughs> different you know it's like a Very. it's like another world it's a completely different world all taking place at the same time so there is no time right it's really contrived yeah wow. so it, it, it's been fun um it it was very interesting to learn about their family dynamics um how their their kids were raised so differently than ours and the struggles that they have are different. We don't deal with, you know, we don't deal with addiction and we don't, I mean, some people do, but on our family, we don't, which I'm very thankful for. But to hear her struggles and my struggles are so different, but yet they're the same, you know, as mothers. But anyway, it, it's been a wonderful friendship that I, can't wait to go see them. <laughs> that will be an adventure. That will be an adventure. <laughs> It'll be like a movie. You'll definitely have to have like video and <laughs> people yeah. videoing you and your response <laughs> to it. Did you get any video of Donna's response to walking into your house and being on the horse and just her expressions? And You know, I just got some pictures. I didn't get videos, but it was uh, by the look on her face, you can tell that she she was completely out of her element and it was so wonderful to share our world with her and her husband okay so tell the story about the horseback riding they flew into great falls which is 83 miles south of shelby and it was dark and we told them you know that we would meet them at the motel in the morning um when they rented a car and they drove it was completely blackout and she was um having a anxiety attack 
and they kept calling us, you know, where are we? Where are we? There's no one out here. And my husband would say, what mile marker are you at? Okay, 30 miles, you're going to see some light. It's going to be a little town. Keep coming. And the, so the next morning, we picked him up at the motel. Uh, truck and trailer loaded with horses. And they were decked out to the nines with, with their fashion boots and their fancy clothes. And I said, Donna, we're only going up to move cows. I mean, we're just going to go ride around some cows. And so we get them on horseback and start riding. And I've got, you know, some nuts and some waters in my saddlebag. And she kept saying, how far are we going? I said, we're just going to go up to that next branch. Well, how far is it? Well, it's only like three pastures. Well, how far is a pasture? Well, it's a mile. And by the time we got to about the second mile, she was already in pain. And I saw a bale truck coming down the dirt road. And I knew who it was. Of course he did. He stopped <laughs> to say hi. And I said, you know, there's a cold beer back at the horse trailer if you take down a bath. Because she's not going to make it. And Charles, he made it. He kept up with me. But um, our pastor was with us and his daughter. And his daughter was just giggling because there's this little girl on the horse. And Donna, Donna was like, I'm off. I am done with it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it was very rewarding to take them up and to see the open bass ranches that are here can you imagine the stories that she's telling back in new jersey like who is she talking to the, all the women where they're getting their fingernails done right and she's yep. like oh my gosh i went on a horse one time <laughs> in montana and people are probably like ah oh, tell us all about it was it just like yellowstone <laughs> yeah. she, she said that she really wants um my husband to especially come out there because he has little sayings that are, we call them Jeffisms, and um, they're they're kind of brassy. And she said, you have to meet my friends. My friends will not believe you. <laughs> and so, um, and he just, he just look at Donna and say, I don't, I don't want to meet, and I don't want to come to New Jersey, you know, but I, we will go because I want to meet her friends and the way they are. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we will be totally out of our own. Of when course. We're there. And that's fair, right? It's important yep. that you experience the other side of this so you can see what they're dealing with day in and day out. And I can tell you, I've, I lived in cities, big cities. I lived in Washington, DC and you're right. Those challenges are really different from the challenges that you face. And there's, there, it's all relative, right? Trying to get on, uh, get through traffic in New Jersey and parts of New Jersey. Obviously, this is like the city parts of New Jersey, which this New Jersey isn't all city. It actually has some pretty decent ag land on the, the west side of it. But um, I think about how different that is and how important it is for you to be able to go and explore that and for Jeff to do it. And also because you make such good ambassadors. Oh, thank you. It's so important for people to see that this is real life too, that this isn't a TV show, that this is how people live and to understand where their meat comes from and to see that there are people who live this lifestyle that is a polar opposite to what their experiences, their, what their experiences are. And I think it just connects us so much better when you have good ambassadors for that. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, she doesn't, Donna doesn't like the fact that, like, we brand calves in the spring. Well, she comes from, that's like cruelty to animals. Mm -hmm. But where we come from, if you don't brand them, that's how you tag them that, you know, and it doesn't hurt the calves. They, they're all fine. But she just doesn't, she just does not understand that. That that's a very important part of being a rancher. Mm -hmm. So you identify know. them. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, there are so many things. 
about what you do where you are that people wouldn't understand until they got there and saw why you do what you do and and how it's done the the most humane way possible right it's not you're not intentionally being cruel or hurting an animal you're doing this in a way that makes sense and that is going to be the least painful i guess for the calf yeah well and that that brings up that whole other thing of (laughs) actually this is a funny story my niece and her best friend came to visit me from they're in the berkeley area of california and yes so even though they're in a little tiny town called albany it's a little city within the city of berkeley and it's incorporated as its own city of albany and yet um, and they laugh about it being such a small city. You know, Albany's small. Everybody knows everybody. And yet you cross a street and you don't even know you're crossing in Berkeley. And Berkeley is not small. And you go from Berkeley, you do, you cross one street, you don't even know you're in Oakland. Or from from Berkeley into Richmond, which is another city. But you don't even know you're leaving one city and getting into another because they're all so connected. And then, of course, you just cross the bridge and you're in San Francisco, for goodness sake. So um, I had them in Helena, Montana, which is a a small city. And you can drive 10 minutes any direction and really not see the city at all. And I took them out to our big lake. It's called Cannon Ferry Lake with a couple of kayaks in the back of the truck so that they could go paddle in the kayaks and explore this, this lake. And as we were driving out there, we left the city within, you know, 10 minutes of leaving our house. We're out of the city. We're in total ag land, ranch and uh, hay fields and, you know, a serious agricultural land. And one of them said, why aren't there any houses out here? Why aren't there any buildings out here? They need to, they need to start building out here. And I looked at them and said, where do you think your food comes from? <laughs> And they really, they had no idea. And, and they, they eat organic food. You know, they, they pay attention to the ingredients and what they're eating. But they hadn't experienced what I was showing them. So I keep thinking about Donna and Charles showing up and driving in the dark for an hour or more and not having any street lights. All they're driving with is the headlights of their car. And if they had pulled over just for a moment and gotten out to look up, they wouldn't have even known what the stars were because they can't see them with all the light pollution in New Jersey. Yep. That's did great. They, did they talk about that at all? Were they I I don't uh, believe I don't believe they did. I don't remember them talking about seeing the stars, but our daughter who lives in Denver misses the stars. Yes. You know. Because you, yeah. you don't get to experience that. No, it's just it's so different. Just the silence, the silence of no sirens, no traffic, mm-hmm. no, you know, no trains. It's just you can step outside and it's silent. And that, that was really weird to them. Well, it's even rare to hear an airplane going overhead. I mean, you, you hear them, but not as, not nearly as often as I hear them here in Helena. Yeah, that's right. Yep. Uh, that's so interesting. So beyond the Furrier, you also do other kinds of art, right? And I would love to hear just a you know a little bit more about what you do up in Shelby or outside of Shelby on your ranch. Um, we um, well, I do leather work. I do leather tooling to make belts and um, journals, um, custom made leather tooling products for people. I also work with a lot of skulls. Like I will um, take buffalo skulls. There's a a big place out of Wyoming. And Eric, the same man in Muscle Show, he provides me with the buffalo skulls. I can buy them from him. And then I will either paint on them or cover them in furs or leather. And then I sell them at art shows. Oh, that's so cool. So what is one reaction that you've gotten from somebody that was that made you realize that you were exactly 
where you were supposed to be doing what you're doing. Because I, I imagine um, just from my the ceramic work that I've done in the past, I, I had a studio for 13 years growing on the wheel and I'm also a musician. So one of the things that really lights me up is when I see somebody really respond to what I'm doing, either my art or my music. And like, for instance, a, a woman at an event where I was singing in a, with a jazz group, I was singing the song Dream a Little Dream, and she must have been in her 70s. And I remember getting off the stage to go take our break and going over to her and thanking her for listening and, and clapping because it had been a very strange, strange performance. And with tears in her eyes, she put her hand on my arm and said, that was my mother's favorite song. Oh, sweet. So those are those moments that make me realize how important it is that I connect with the audience. It's not just singing. It's a performance and it's connecting and sharing that energy. So tell me about a time like that for you with your art. A lot of people come up into my art room and they feel the furs and and then they say, I've got my grandmother's coat and I don't know what to do with it. Do you think you could do something with it? And I say, I can make you an heirloom teddy bear or I can take that fur and put it on a hat. I can make collars for your coats or maybe a vest with that fur on it. And it's something that they can keep, but you know, grandma's coat, they don't want to get rid of it but they don't know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. And so that's always nice that I can, that I can make something for them that becomes an heirloom. So you made a teddy bear out of somebody's coat? Yes. Tell me about that. Yeah. Um, a lady, uh, she went into a store in Lincoln, Montana. Lincoln, Montana. So for our listeners, Lincoln, Montana is famous for the Unabomber. That's where yeah. you yep. just hold up for a little while. But if you come to Montana, you will find the Lincoln area to be famous for the Blackfoot River that goes by it and Highway 200. That is one of the most spectacular drives between um, the Great Falls or uh, Interstate 15 and Missoula. So for our listeners, if you come to Montana, you don't want to miss that drive in good weather. Don't go when it's bad weather. But that's what Lincoln is famous for. And it's about a 90-minute drive from Helena going north and slightly west. All right. Just I want to make sure people have kind of a, an image of what Lincoln, Montana is like. It's a little, little tiny, like one street town. Yeah. Very, very small town. And they also have a race to the sky. Yes, the the, um, the dog dog. sleds. Yeah, the yeah. sled dog race. So um, she has a store there and she sells a lot of furs that are created by a man and his wife in Cut Bank, which is 30 miles west of us. And so she had called me up and said, this lady, you know, came in and wanted this teddy bear meat. I said, oh, have her send me her mother's mink stole. And so... From that mint stole, I even put the tags that were from the inside that had her mother's name on them. I even incorporated them into the bottom of the bear and the back of the bear because to me, that's very important as part of that stole that she had kept from her mother's and she was totally blown away by getting this teddy bear. She was just, she couldn't believe that it had hung in her closet for all those years and she never could enjoy it. But now the teddy bear sits on her bed and she can enjoy it. Ah, uh, that just makes my eyes well up a little bit thinking about my grandmother's clothes and um, yeah, on both sides, both sides of my family have, my grandmother's had really beautiful taste and style. And a, a friend of mine this last week, uh, we went to Bozeman. And she's a dear friend. We just went to Nashville for this last week. But um, her daughter married uh, a guy in Bozeman. And his mother 
wore Pendleton wool. Mm-hmm. And so she sent me a bunch of Pendleton wool from her mother-in-law's skirts. And she wanted me to make napkin box covers for Christmas. Uh, so I figured out how to make this reversible napkin box cover. And then I decided I'm going to surprise them with matching hats for their entire family. Oh, wow. That they could wear to the ski hill outside of Bozeman. So this last week, when we showed up in Bozeman to fly out to go to Nashville, I gave her and her husband and daughter and son these matching hats made from his mother's Pendleton wool skirts. Oh. And he couldn't believe it. I mean, they absolutely love them. So that was really fun. It was fun for me to give, to make something that could be so special, and they all match. And so that was really rewarding. It's so meaningful. And it just it just brings everything together in terms of what art can do and why it's so critical that we value art and the the connection that it makes across generations. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Yep. Wow. And thank you for doing that because it it's such a thoughtful gift. And as I said, you're such a good ambassador for the work you do, for the for the lifestyle you lead and for us as people who live in Montana and and live here. We don't just visit. As I mentioned um, during my our panel discussion where you and I sat next to each other and shared a few of our stories for the audience, I mentioned that I noticed very quickly that when you come to Montana to live here, you either stay, develop roots, and find out what you're really made of. You start to understand your grit or it chews you up and it spits you out. And I am so grateful that I had the opportunity to meet this amazing woman, Jeanette Jurgens, and to hear your stories, because I know that I'll continue to hear your stories and see your art and how it represents our state and how different and unique it is to live here. Well, thank you. Yeah, it was a pleasure meeting you. That was that was so much fun. It was. So um, just to come full circle and wrap this up, um, what was something about that conference that either surprised you or just warms your soul to think about? I went into it um, not really knowing what I was getting into because I am pretty much, uh, I stay in my own world. Um, Of course, I've met people, but they approached me uh, or my husband and I. And so when I was asked to speak at that, I contacted my daughter. I've, we've got two daughters, one in Shoto and one in Denver. And I contacted the one in Denver and I said, I really don't know what I'm going to talk about. And she said, mom, this and this and this and this, this is what, you know, you do. It's a storytelling conference. So when I got there, I was like, okay, you know, I, maybe my stories are interesting or my lifestyle is interesting or my artwork. And so when I met you and Carissa and the wonderful ladies, it was so rewarding to, to meet other powerful women. And to know that, I guess to know that something that you do and your lifestyle makes a difference. Because sometimes we get locked in our worlds. And like, I I compare my world kind of like to a baseball. It's kind of beat up after a long time, but yet kids will come and pick it up. And then it becomes a gem to them. And then... And then, you know, you're maybe sometime you'll be put on a shelf for someone to treasure, you know? And so I think of our lives that we all come from different 
different walks of life and we're all kind of beat up in a way. But, but when we tap into our full potential and we just try, it is so rewarding. And, and I think that we, um, in Montana, we're kind of segregated out here in the middle of nowhere with, um, you know, no stoplights and one grocery store, but yet we can touch people's lives. And that is so rewarding. But meeting the powerful women there, that was, that was well worth the weekend. It was wonderful. Oh, lovely. I, I don't even know how to answer that. I can't express how much I appreciate hearing what you have to say. And listeners, now it's your turn. What stories are you telling that you don't even realize how meaningful they can be to others? What stories are you telling to represent your life, your beaten up baseball, so that others can value them and treasure those stories? If you'd like to learn more about Jeanette, links will be on in the podcast show notes associated with this podcast episode at elkinsconsulting.com. I encourage you to look up Jeanette's work and keep in touch with her. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, Sarah. I love it. Thank you. We have to get together again soon. Smile, what's the use of crying? You'll find that life is still worthwhile if you just smile.